Hi, welcome. Uh, this is a <laughs> my last tutorial video I did. I said this is going to be a quick, short video. It ended up being a two-hour-long video. So hopefully, I can do better than that. This is um, a short video on the starter set for the One Ring. I've already done an unboxing for this. So what I want to do now is actually cover and explain the rules of the starter set. Um, I since I know that uh, role-playing games are quite cumbersome to sort of get through all the material and also understand it before you can play, this is somewhat of a barrier of entry. Um, I'm going to try to create a video here that will make it far easier for somebody to jump in. And essentially, if I'm honest, these videos are for myself. Uh, I, I like to sort of um, go through the material and then um, make notes and then come back and make a video of it and then later on it's just easy for me to watch the video if I ever want to get a refresher. So I'll just jump straight in. Um, I won't worry about all the other stuff because I've already covered uh, what you get in the box so I'm, I'm not really gonna um, delve all into too much about all that kind of stuff. Um, this nice. You don't get this bag though. Um, I need to get these cards. I've got extra cards. Um, Alright so let me just put this here. All right, so I'll just jump straight in. Um, a little bookmark there. I need that. Okay, so uh, just credits. I'm not going to go through every page because I don't want to. Um, what's the word? Put the whole book on YouTube. So I am going to um, essentially just go straight into explaining the rules uh, while showing some pages. All right. So, in the beginning, it's the prologue, so that just covers um, just a brief introduction, similar to um, the original One Ring. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, the starter set is a condensed version of the role-playing game. So it's it's a light version. Uh, it's a great way to learn the system without getting bogged down with too much of the details. Um, it keeps things simple, and it yeah, it's it's a, a a wonderful sort of jumping off point for anybody that wants to kind of just dip their their toes into it, get a feel for it, and then jump into the rules. Um, for that very reason, I explained earlier that the rules can sometimes be quite a barrier. You need to get through this thick rule book before you can start playing. Um, so they start off with an example of play, um, and what I found, I just read through the example of play, and. Um, this is a few things I noted, um, which just from the example of play, uh, if you pay attention, you can actually sort of uh, pick up on, on how the game works. So, um, when you spend hope in second edition, um, it's different from how first edition works. Uh, I won't go into how first edition works because that might cause confusion, but when you spend hope um, on your character sheet, Oh yeah, you get some character sheets. That's very good for me to just pull those out. Um, are these the character sheets? Yeah, they are. They're kind of like wedges in the bottom of the box. There we go. There they are. And yeah, the box has got a nice little lore master sort of screen. It's cool. Um, I see something. I think the lid actually functions as the lore master screen essentially because it's got a cheat sheet there. Nice little cheat sheet. All right, so let's use Drogo Baggins um, as an example. Is there somebody else that I can maybe use? I think I look at Drogo Baggins too often. I think I want to try somebody else here. Yeah. Let's look at Paladin Took. All right, so with the, the rules, they refer to... Um, I'm going to go through how the, the rule book covers the content. So they go to example of play. I'm going to start there. So on your character sheet, you have hope. You can see there, you've got uh, 17 hope. And um, so you're on the character sheet for Paladin and Took. You can see here's the thing for your current hope and your current endurance. All right. So that's where you keep track of how much you have currently. All right. Those two areas. So endurance is like your health uh, or your stamina. Um, and hope is sort of, uh, it's a currency you get to spend to sort of help you, to boost you. 
Um, so it, it kind of gives a little bit of control back to the players and you can choose when to do that. So here's your total hope and you'll start off with 17 but then as you use it it'll go down. Okay, so that's one of the first things that they touch on in the starter set is that spending hope gives you um, one additional d6. I'll just use um, I'll use my original 1e dice. I've just got a bunch here. Um, okay, so these are the ones from 2nd edition. Um, yeah, maybe I'll use those. It doesn't confuse anyone. I'll use those. It's okay. Go. Okay. Here you can pull in your current hope and your current endurance. Um, that's essentially what you have left. This is your total that you start off with. You start off 17 hope and you start off with 23 endurance. You'll fill that in your character sheet here and you'll just keep erasing and deducting as you spend them or as you lose endurance. Endurance is like your stamina or your health and hope is a, a bit of like a, um, a currency or a boost you get to use to sort of modify the game or give yourself a little bit of assistance and it, it kind of gives the control back to the players in moments of uh, need. So, to give you an example, let's just say we're having a role-playing game, we, we, we're playing a session, and uh, I want to sneak past some orcs. So, I would then um, explain this to the, to the lore master, which is the, 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 like the narrator, and uh, other games call it the game master or the dungeon master, in this game it's called the lore master, and I would explain to them saying, hey, I want to use stealth, and this is what I'm trying to achieve, I'm trying to sneak past them, so I can maybe set fire to some um, barrels. Um, so the master will agree saying sure. Um, he might make me make two rolls because craft is for making fire so I might need to make two rolls. But <clears throat> let's just see if I pass that stealth roll first. So you roll stealth, you roll 1d12. D uh, D and you have, uh, th we have three stats in stealth which means I get to roll 3d6 dice. Okay, but there is a little um, something to keep mind. Keep in mind is that if you have a little uh, mark next to your your skill, that means it's favored. All that happens then is you get to roll two d12s with your d6s, and when you roll that, you get to keep the highest score, whichever one you know is is the best result. You get to keep that. All right, so that's how that works. So. I'm explaining to you how a normal skill roll works. Okay, um, so a, a Gandalf rune is an automatic um, success. So that, that roll was immediately a success. Um, we don't even have to look at the rest of those dice. Um, uh, an Isle Sauron, that equals zero. So that, that means that's zero. And then we've got our normal um, dice here for uh, two, four, and five. So I have rolled, um, what's that, 11? Yeah. Um, but that doesn't really matter because I've got the automatic success. And you can see I kept the, the best of the two. Because if I rolled that, um, the target number, and that's something also I have to sort of clarify here, is when you do a skill roll, what's the number you're trying to uh, match? And that number is above your skill that you're rolling. So you would look at your wits target number, which is 14, and you're trying to um, pass 14. So if this wasn't a favorite skill, if it was just a normal stealth, and I rolled this, I would have failed, so that's 11, and that equals 0. But thankfully it was a favorite skill, so I got to roll two d12s, and I get to keep the best one. So now I automatically passed. If I had to roll something like, let's just say, um, that, Okay, so I rolled a 2 and the 11. So I'm on 13, and it's just, you can see, I would have missed it with 14. So if I'm a bit worried that I'm going to um, not meet that target number, um, I'm going to spend that point of hope, that, that point of hope that I discussed earlier. It's that sort of bonus currency that you get to use. It, um, so what a point of hope does is it gives you an additional uh, d6 to your dice. Uh, your dice roll, your dice pool. But you have to spend that before you make the roll. So now we've gone from three extra dice to go with our d12. 
So we're going to go from our d12 with three extra dice. We're going to spend a point of hope that makes, takes us up to four. And now we get to roll that. And it's favored. I get to roll two d12s. That's quite a nice dice pool. Um, the d12s both landed on a nine. So I'll just choose one of them. And I can immediately see I've passed because uh, that's 10 and that's 20. It's 22. We had to hit 14. Okay, so that's a success. Then um, I don't really cover this at all in the starter set, but I do recall in um, a previous version of the game, one edition, they used to encourage players to describe their action to the rest of the players. So it's not the law master, the narrator sitting there, who's sort of playing the referee and the narrator at the same time. He's constantly, or he or she's constantly describing the scene and, and um, kind of, um, yeah, like I said, play, you sort of performing a referee role. Um, you want the players to sort of engage in the narrative as well. So when you do a skill check, a skill role, or a combat role, if you fail or succeed, describe what your character did uh, and how that looked in them succeeding or describe how it looked in them failing. And then the law master can kind of uh, give you the, the mechanical outcome. Okay, because you failed, this is going to happen. Because you succeeded, you managed to do what you set out to do. Okay, so that hopefully explains to you the basics of what a skill is, um, what endurance is, what hope is, what favored is, and how a skill role works and how to check for the target numbers. So if I had to do athletics, that falls under strength, and the target number is 15. Okay, so, and every, you'll see if you look at the different characters, their target numbers are different. It's based on your, your, um, your character's stats. Okay, so going back to the, I kind of skipped ahead here, but I think it's quite important just for you to understand the basics of what the dice roll, the rolls are and how they work. Um, so then if I had passed that skill roll, I would have explained how I managed to sneak past those, those orcs. Um, and then I would go, and I would, I would obviously try to, try to, try to, instead of just saying I snuck by, I passed the barrels. I think it's obviously everyone, you gotta, you gotta feel comfortable if that's how you, how you want to describe sort of your role, go ahead and do that. But I always think it's great to take the opportunity to get a little bit more expressive and like um, kind of improvise and think, okay, how would he sneak past it? Maybe he's um, pulls a bit of a, uh, a Gandalf move and uh, like a little trick and he nudges the one orc and sneaks aside and, and watches that orc get frustrated with the other orc next to him and they start squabbling and pushing each other and that forms a complete distraction and now everyone's kind of in this big brawl and he sneaks to the barrels and then the the law master says okay now you can roll your craft to see if you can make that fire so that is 1d12 and 1d6 okay so you always get the d12 but then you get that 1d6 to go with it because i've got one rank in that so i'll definitely spend hope and that's going to give me another uh, D6 and I believe you can only spend one point of hope uh, per roll so you, you can't sort of stack it higher than that so I'm trying to meet a target number 15 I don't know if I'm gonna get this so I do I do I roll 17 and this is a great example so now I've got I'm gonna try not mess up this uh, roll I got there let me see what I roll Okay, because I've rolled a six, in most games a six is a good, a good thing, uh, and in this case that is true. Now they focus on the the symbol on the six, which is a Teng Wan rune. Um, because I got the Teng Wan rune, there is um, what they call a it's a special success, and there's different ways you can sp spend that. Okay, so I don't know if you'll have to see that because the the light's shining on it, but there you can see a little table. Um, which describes the degrees of success and I'll see if I can tilt it if you can see it better then yeah there you go so the degrees of success is if no icons are roll, uh, icons were scored the action was successful but it didn't achieve anything beyond the bare minimum success if a sing uh, so you get a single ting one if a single ting one was scored then the player here is accomplishment was out of the ordinary a great success 
if you get two Teng ones, uh, if two or more Teng one icons were scored, the result was um, what does it say there? Absolutely exceptional and memorable and extraordinary success. Okay, so they don't really cover um, what you can do with with uh, with those outside of combat, I believe, in the in the starter sets. Let's have a look here. It's page ten. Yeah, so yeah, they don't really really uh, explain what you can do with those. Yeah, so in in the um, starter rules they keep it quite simple. I know in the core rule book you can actually spend those uh, special successes. You can spend when you roll uh, a six, you can cash that in and do something with that. Now in the in the rules, um, they do cover what you can do with that in combat. They don't really cover what you can do with that in other cases. So with me trying to make a fire, um, I got, uh, what do they call it again? Um, a great success. So I, I'm just going to explain that narratively and say that the Hobbit uh, tried to light a small fire and light the barrel, but he didn't realize that barrel was maybe full of gun gunpowder and it exploded and it just started this huge, huge fire, um, which just started setting everything ablaze. Um, maybe even took out some of the, I don't know, that, that would probably be, a, uh, if, if I was hoping to maybe take out some orcs, it would probably be an extraordinary success, which means I rolled um, two of these, but I only rolled one, so I managed to light the fire, and I did, you know, more than I, I set out to do, I got, I got a little bit more lucky. Um, so there, that, that's how Paddle and Tooth managed to get past the orcs using stealth and set fire to uh, a wooden barrel that ended up being full with gunpowder. All right, so that, that covers um, hope, endurance, um, your skill, your ranks, if it's favored, your target number, and um, what a, a special success, um, what do they call it, a degrees of success, a special success, yeah. All right, so I'm going to move over. That was the very first point I wanted to talk about, and I lingered on that a little bit longer than I actually anticipated. So let me just scroll up. All right, target numbers I've covered. Um, scan, in, in the examples of play, scan is used to examine the outdoors based on the play example on the starter set. So scan is, is different to explore. So scan is more for, um, well, in this case they used it for outdoors. But I know explore... Um, I remember reading once where explore is more for outdoors and scans for indoors, but um, we'll cover that a little bit later. I think they, they break it down. But in the play example, they used scan to um, examine the outdoors. Um, so, yeah, that one always tricks me up a little bit. I, I've kind of house ruled it in my head where explore is for outdoor things and scan is for indoor, but I think I touched on a note regarding that a little bit later. Let's have a look. Yeah, skills is on page 14. So I'll just jump straight from examples of play to 14. Seems like that's how we all do this video. I was gonna, I was kind of hoping to go from the start to finish, but it just makes more sense just to kind of stick on the topic and just explain it as I go. So scan is, let's see, player heroes use scan, use the scan skill when examining something closely or attentively. The skill allows a player to skim through a book to locate a piece of relevant information, look for concealed doors or hidden inscriptions, recognize a familiar face in a crowd, or locate a set of tracks on the ground. Scan rolls are generally initiated by the player rather than the law master. One role is required for each inspection of a small area, such as a room, Awareness rather than scan is used if a player passively knows this is something. Okay, so there we get a, a good example or good description of what scan is. So scan is when you you intensely sort of focusing on something and you examining it, um, which makes sense. Scan being more of an indoor thing, but you could do a scan outdoors if you're scanning a, a, a I guess a lock to see um, you're scanning a door to see if there's any. In, um, inscriptions on the door. Alright, so then uh, explore 
probably on that. Yeah, we go. Yes, Paul. A player hero. Um, player heroes rely on the explore skill when they move through an unfamiliar area of the wild. An explore role may be required during a journey to find out where the company is heading or to get back on track after a detour. To cope with the adverse natural hazards, to create paths through the wilderness or to choose a suitable place to set up camp. So yeah, kind of close to what I had in mind. So explore is for outdoors and um, you kind of... Ex ex sort of um what did they say yeah you exploring unfamiliar territory okay so it's sort of a bit more broader um than scan which is quite condensed focused on a small area small object okay so let's scan and explore craft um the craft skill and that's, I'm just touching on some skills that might be mistaken so that's why I'm kind of touching on these um, the, the, the core rule book does go into detail what each one is but for me like a scan and explore I can get those two confused and craft can be quite misleading because you can actually craft is used to untie things to pick locks um, or uh, start a fire that kind of thing so craft might be mistaken for something else. Um, I believe craft can also be used to repair something, um, a, like a quick makeshift repair. So just keep in mind craft is quite versatile. Um, if you plan to ambush a surprise uh, characters, um, so if the, the, if the law master, the game master, wants to check um, if if you've been ambushed you would have to he would request that you do an awareness check um, so that's just how awareness one of the things will work you could also um, probably tell the law master in certain circumstances hey I would like to make an awareness check um, to see if 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 I notice something um, so you could also initiate, or, or what's the right word? Um, yeah, initiate. You could also initiate an awareness check, um, but the law master also gets to do that. So uh, a note that I picked up um, when going through the examples of play, very soon after that, they touch on the year as well, which is, um, yeah, 2960. Okay. So the year is 2960, and um, that's 20 years after the Battle of Five Armies. So that's a f couple of years after the first edition game. So those adventures you went on in the first edition, this happens after that. All right, so let me move over to uh, the Shire. So in the starter set, they give you pre-generated characters, um, which you see here. Uh, you, they don't give you the rules to create your own characters in the starter set. They keep it simplistic um, and um, I think it was a very wise move to simplify the rules so that you don't get um, overloaded uh, with too many options. Um, there is an explanation on um, the law master uh, he describes the setting and manages what happens. So they're just sort of giving you an idea of what a law master is. So he's the eyes and ears of the players. Uh, he sets the scene and he plays the part of the NPCs, uh, peaceful or hostile or creatures or and, uh, adversaries. Okay, so he, he handles everything outside of your character if you're the player. Um, and just keep in mind, sort of, there's also a description a bit more on what Middle Earth is. And Middle Earth is is sort of like a vast place so there's there's sort of lots of unexplored areas and um, sort of uncertain boundaries people are quite localized so that gives lots of opportunity for exploration okay so then you have the structure of the game and it's very much about not hearing the story being played but actually participating in, in, in um, crafting that narrative so that's quite important um, to keep in mind when role-playing uh, especially the the wandering that's what they're kind of encouraging but I, I believe most role-playing games take that approach but it's just good to sort of detail it to especially new players um just remember the player 
they control their character. They can't control the NPCs. Or so when they when they describing a scene, they can't say my can't say my character persuades this character, and then that character responds this way. The the law master uh, determines and describes how other players, uh, other characters respond. Um, so players describe how their characters react to situations, and that's called taking an action. So a basic breakdown of a, of a game would be when you sit down for evening in a say three hour session, that's called uh, a, a session, and a session is divided up into scenes. Um, so basically, there's your your group will be, be preparing um, for a challenge, or they'll be already engaged in a challenge, or they're re recovering from a challenge. Those are kind of like the 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 super simplified sort of explanations of what a scene could look like. Um, they are framed by the law master who controls the NPCs in the environment. So the NPC is sort of describing the location, who is there, uh, who are the adversary, are the adversaries ally, allies, what is the challenge. So that's very much um, sort of the law master sort of kicks things off and covers location, who friendly or host, uh, hostile, and what's the challenge. And then the players, uh, uh, they describe how their characters react to the situation, sort of choosing what, what actions they want to take. Um, and those could be uh, skill skill checks, or you know, if, if it happens, it could go into combat. Um, so yeah, we've got that already. Um, uh, we'll move on to action resolution. In general, there are no turns in the One Ring. It's got very much a board game mindset. So I like the sort of, you know, move from person to person around the table. But it's actually, I must, I've, I've slowly but surely been converted to the idea that sort of free form conversation is actually the best way to do it. It's very sort of, um, what's the word, uh, spontaneous. But you also just got to keep track of if there's somebody being left out the law master maybe wants to then prompt them saying what would you like to do you know describe what your character's doing what are your actions what are your plans um because you in most groups you'll get some people that are or maybe uh, carry a bit more of a, a presence in the game um not in the game world as much as maybe at the table and they could possibly dominate the you know the narrative space and it's so important for the law master and even other players to give um space for those that are maybe a bit more reserved. Um, players get involved by taking action, so they tell the law master what they are doing and how they intend to do it. Um, they request skill checks, so the the wandering requests an action only if you might think the character could fail. So if, if you are <laughs> Walking to the Prancing Pony, you do not have to make a travel roll if you're just walking a short distance or an athletics check. It's just assumed that's okay. If you order um, uh, uh, ale over the, over the, from, the, from the barman, it's just assumed he's going to sell it to you. You don't need to do a persuasion check. So hopefully you understand some things can just be um, commonly accepted as, yeah, you all succeeded that, and then save the 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 skill checks for when you're doing something that might you know require a little bit more effort so maybe um if you're trying to let's say the barman says that the inn is if there's an inn above says the inn is full then you want to maybe do a persuade and you want to convince him to let you you know maybe find room for you so that would you can see you sort of You've met with a, an, an, a challenge, and you do a skill check to kind of overcome that challenge. Um, so, yeah, skill checks are generally classified in: uh, is it a danger, or is there knowledge you want to, uh, you know, obtain, obtain, or do you, are you trying to manipulate something? If some, if someone's not being cooperative. So that example I gave now would probably be manipulation. You're trying to adjust the, the, the innkeeper or the barman um, to be more cooperative. Um, but other examples are if someone's conceding something, so that's a knowledge one, and then there's danger, which is a challenge. So danger, knowledge, and manipulation. So that's just sort of uh, summarize it, summarizes, summarizes when you would use the skill checks into three simple categories. 
Um, in general, any one player should make a, a roll, especially if they uh, take an action, but also when the law master requests a roll. So if the law master requests a roll, the player can choose who is the best suited. So what I mean by that is, um, if if I say I want to do a stealth roll, generally I am doing the stealth roll. Or if the law master says, okay, uh, you know, you want to try to persuade the barman, then maybe you guys, the, the players would discuss who's the best at persuasion, uh, and they would make that roll. So you're not finding the whole group rolling, because that can be quite confuse if you passed or not, because some people would pass the persuasion, but some wouldn't. And it's generally just try to keep it to one roll. Um, so skill rolls, there's 18 skills um, in total. So uh, those are these here. There's 18 in total. And um, combat rolls uh, equal combat proficiencies. I'll just bring this back. So that's these over here. So uh, different from your skill checks, you have combat proficiencies. It still falls under strength, but it's a bit different to your skill rolls. Those are used in combat. So um, then you also have, um, where are those? So you have valor and wisdom. So those come into play, um, for example, if there's sort of fear and sorcery, the law master can request a uh, test to resist those so maybe you'll ask a, a valor test or a wisdom test so he would actually requ request that from you so you would take in this case a d12 a d12 and a d6 uh, because it's one point in wisdom or one point in valor and you would roll maybe and to see if you succeed so in this case uh, paladin took would do probably succeed more at valor because his target number is 11 Maybe he's not so, you know, so sharp, and he, his target number is 14 on that. So if some somebody's trying to uh, in, sort of lure him into a trap, he would have to make a, a wisdom check. Um, if maybe um, a white showed up, he has to see if he, he would have to do a, a, you know, if he, if he succumbs to fear kind of thing. Um, and that's, he'll do a valid check, target number 11. All right, so... That's where Vela and Wisdom come in. So the dice pool is um, the feat die plus the skill or combat rating. So one success die per rank, and we did cover that already. Uh, the target number is the rolled ability required target number based on the strength, heart, or wits. Your, um, you start with a target number of 20 and minus the appropriate attribute score. Success, um, that's if you meet or exceed the target number. So you, if you roll, you just have to meet the target number 14, or you can uh, roll past that, but you just have to meet that line. That's what's uh, considered success, and I've already covered that a Gandalf rune is uh, automatic success, and, uh, and uh, Eye of Sauron is equals zero. Um, failure outcome combat. Um, if you fail the check, um, let's have a look here. Failure outcome combat is specific. Uh, other fail checks. So if you fail a combat check, you just didn't strike the enemy. Um, but if you fail a skill check, uh, that's sort of creatively inspired by the GM, um, the law master, how they would, um, how that's going to. What, what the negative effect is. So that's kind of um, creatively inspired by the law, law master. Um, so keep that in mind. So a failed skill check, uh, the law master kind of creatively determines what the outcome of that negative uh, failure is going to be. But in combat, it's quite specific. You either do strike them or if you don't, kind of thing. Um, sh failure should always carry a negative uh, consequences. Um, so it's important that if you fail at something, it, it shouldn't be like, okay, you just didn't do it, but there should be a negative consequence um, for, for attempting it. Um, it shouldn't just be like, okay, you, that skill roll essentially didn't happen. You failed, it didn't happen, you carry on. It's if you fail, maybe you knock the barrel over and you draw attention to yourself if that was maybe a stealth roll. Okay. Um, a test can only be attempted once if the law master permits it. Um, it can be attempted again using a different ability, and each failure adds an additional negative to the consequences. And um, 
Um, so superior success is uh, check the degrees of success on page 10, uh, which we are now. Uh, they don't really, just like I covered it earlier, they don't really cover what that, it's kind of just narratively inspired what those successes do, but in combat, the successes do more for you. Um, you can actually cash those successes in for, for something in combat. Um, favored roles I've covered, so that's when something's favored. Um, so you get to roll two uh, d12s and keep the, the best one. Ill favored roll is when you're suffering from a negative effect. So when you you also need to roll two d12s if you if you if you have an ill favored effect, and um, and you keep the worst example. So examples of ill-favored would be by an adversary's ability, leaving an ill-favored effect, or a player spending all their hope. Um, and most ill-favored effects impact all the player's roles, not just a single ability. So if if, if you've spent all your hope, you, you the, then you your roles become ill-favored. Um, and then you have to roll two d12s and keep the negative one. Or if your if your adversary's um, one of their abilities have made you ill favored. And um, if you are have a favored roll and ill favored, they cancel each other out. Even if you have more of the one than the other, um, you just roll one d. Um, there's no if you got more ill favor or more favored. It's just cancels them out. Bonus dice, um, so basically favorable circumstances or a beneficial talent, the law master of the campaign determine, can determine this and they can grant you an additional uh, d6 on a roll. So that's called a bonus success die. Uh, penalty success die is uh, if the player has made some bad decisions or um, maybe the circumstances, the law master or campaign will determine that and they'll remove a d6 from you. Uh, if you have conflicting bonuses or penalty dice, they are just added and subtracted and whatever your, your, your total is at the end, that's what happens. So if you get a bonus and a penalty at the same time, uh, depends on how many bonuses or how many penalties, you just do the math. Um, and one point of hope grants one additional d12 and uh, hope must be spent before the roll and any one point of hope can be spent at a time. Hope can be spent on any roll any role you're doing, if it's combat or a skill check. Uh, condition modifiers, um, so conditions that modify a player's role, so if you're weary, so weary is a condition you can tick over there. When you're weary, it's when your endurance drops to equal or below your load. So you'll see here's your load, uh, based on your armor and what you're carrying, um, and you have a total load, uh, let's see where, there's your total load. And if your um, endurance is less than your load, you're considered weary. And what all that means is, and, and all, it means quite a bit actually, is that when you're rolling, if you roll uh, um, these, they still, they still mean what they say. Four, five, and six still mean what they say. But if you roll uh, one, two, or three, they mean zero, and you'll see that they've got a different color to them. So when you are got the weary box ticked, these give, grant you nothing, where these still work. Okay, that's when you're weary. When your endurance has met, is the same or lower than your load. Okay, and uh, wounded. So um, you risk, you, you basically, if you get, you tick that off if you get wounded in combat, and if you, you basically, risk, you're risking the chance of being knocked out, because if you get a second wound, you're knocked out, um, unconscious, and recovering endurance is much slower if you have a wound. Yeah, the next section is coming out. So all I'll say on action resolution so far uh, at the end is um, the dice roll procedure they cover. This is this section over here. And it's declare uh, what the player is trying to achieve. You have to declare that before you do uh, you do any action rolls, and um, or skill rolls. And the player 
the players, um, they suggest which ability they want to use. It's not the law master that kind of declares, okay, you want to do that, so you should do this. They can make suggestions, and that happens actually quite um, naturally anyways, but it's up to the player to sort of suggest that and say, okay, I would like to try this or that. Um, and then the rest of the players kind of agree, yes, yes, I think that's appropriate. So it kind of puts a little bit more control on the player. It's their character, they suggest what they want to do, and they sort of choose the, the skill they want to use. The other players and a bit of the law master help kind of decide, listen, yeah, is that is that feasible or not? All right. Um, they, the, the player then takes the appropriate dice, so and you factor in if there's hope, if you're favored or ill-favored, that kind of thing. Especially also if you... Um, you then you add and remove dice based on bonuses or penalties so if you uh, wary that kind of thing or if you've got bonus dice um, and yep Gandalf's equal auto success so i equals zero and all numeric values so if you wary it's one two three equals zero i have covered that and um, if you succeed if there's any sixes rolled it reflects in the description so there's any um, your description and the outcome becomes um, more elaborate. Um, and outside of combat, I mean, in, in combat, then it actually has mechanical effects, which I'll touch on later. So um, with characteristics, all, all character sheets, they, they pre-made characters. They, the rules don't include, there's no rules for rolling up your own character in this. I believe I've covered that already. Um, Stats at the front and the backstory, you know, a little bit of flavor text is on the back of it. And um, you've got your strength, heart, and wits. And strength is used for attacks. Um, heart is used for um, valor. Where is, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And... Um, Woods is used for wisdom, so you can see it's all neatly you know, worked out. So you're using strength target number for that, uh, heart for that, and wits for that, the target numbers. Uh, distinctive features. Distinctive features is up here on the top. So this character, Paladin Tuk, is eager and rustic. So in the book, it'll describe what those are. Um, so each one's different. I'm just going to open up my notes quickly again because it, it went off. Um, but they they primarily for role playing purposes. So you get to describe um, sort of it affects how you sort of describe and the, the, the decisions your character makes. So if he's eager, then you role play him as eager. If he's rustic, you role play him as rustic. Um, so it, it's very much sort of you, in your descriptions and sort of the choices you make you kind of factor these distinctive features in. But you can also invoke it, which means you kind of like activate it as an ability. Um, and that's done on an appropriate role. So if, if uh, you do a role of uh, athletics uh, or, or song and you invoke saying, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm also invoke, invoking my distinctive feature, eager, uh, if the circumstances um, is appropriate, um, that causes the skill role to become inspired. So, so when you spend it, similar to um, when your skill is favored or ill favored, remember that gives you uh, 2d12, and if it's favored, you get to keep the best one, uh, well, best one, and if it's ill favored, you get to keep the worst one. Okay, uh, so that's how, remember, that's how skills work if it's favored or ill favored. If you're doing a role and, and you evoke uh, a distinctive feature, it becomes, um, what is the word again? It becomes inspired. That means when you spend hope, uh, you get, instead of just adding one D6 to your, to your dice pool, you get to add two. Okay, so just remember that. If you want to invoke uh, your distinctive feature, it makes your role inspired. All right. Um, and when you do invoke it, uh, make sure that you include that in your description. Uh, why is he eager? How does that look? So don't. I wouldn't. You know, I would encourage you not just to say, "Oh, he's eager and he makes this, this, uh, you know, 
action and you just describe that action normally. I would definitely uh, factor in and explain how he's um, <laughs> how that eagerness plays out in the scene in your actions. So still the, uh, the skill descriptions are on page 14. Then you had uh, favorite skills are marked on the left uh, of the name. So um, that's what I covered there earlier. And skills are listed under the attribute associated with them. So we've covered that. So um, this, these skills are listed under that attribute and that's the target number you use. Um, and combat uh, proficiency checks uh, use the strength to calculate. I believe we've covered that already as well. And combat proficiencies, which are these here, those are co covered on page 17. And combat in general is covered on page 22. And endurance is similar to um, health or stamina. I've covered that already. And skills is on page 14. Battle. The battle skill. When do you use that? It's uh, You use that when facing uh, a group of foes. Um, what that would do for you, I know in 1E battle would... Um, You'd roll battle to see if you get an additional d6 to spend any time during that battle. Um, so you roll it before you go into battle to see if you get any additional dice. Now for um, 2e, I know you, you use battle when you're facing multiple foes, but what does it do for you? Now I want to see if they cover that. Let's have a look. What do they say about battle? Battle. A rating in this skill shows a firm grasp of the rules of battle and the capacity to maneuver appropriately when involved in a violent confrontation. The battle skill can be used to gain an advantage when fighting against a group of foes. So when they say an advantage, that would be uh, like a bonus dice, I believe. They don't really, really cover exactly what that looks like in the um, starter set. So I think uh, a little bit of elaboration there is I believe you'd probably get one additional D6. So we'll see in the main rules if that's, if that's how it is, but it, it, you basically gain an advantage. Craft is not smithing. So where's the sheet now? So craft over here, we've covered that already, but that's not, that's not smithing. That's, you know, you're not a, um, a weapon smith, but it's more making or mending things by hand, uh, repairs, improvised builds, and, and, and starting campfires, that kind of thing. Uh, enheartened is another one that can be confusing. That's motivating others through example, uh, other than words. So you could, you could um, influence others through persuade, which is a different uh, skill over there. But enheartened is when you're kind of doing it through your actions, um, kind of... Also, best used in a crowd, where persuade is probably more on individuals. Uh, yeah. Uh, then explore is more for large area exploration. And just to remind you, scan is more for you know, focused exploration or searching. Hunting can be used for tracking um, and setting traps and using sort of hunting dogs and birds. And insight is another tricky one. Uh, insight does not reveal if someone is lying, it just reveals their motivations. That's also one to keep in mind. So it, it's not, uh, we, we don't want to make it more powerful than it really is. And um, lore, so that's that one over there. It's used for most things knowledge based. You know? However, the, the, the law master should not require a law check regarding a player's own culture. So if, if you're dealing with your own culture, generally it's assumed you, you, uh, you know, already know that information. But if you're dealing with other culture, you can do a law check and see if you actually know that stuff. A riddle is a fun one. Uh, riddle is... Um, you can make, you make sense of scraps of information. Uh, or to conceal part of what you know, you can use riddle. Um, and you can also speak and decipher riddles. But it's not. It's it's a it's a good one where you can conceal something you 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 know. So you, you don't want to really persuade in that case. You roll riddles. You kind of concealing what you know in your in the way you respond, or when someone else speaks, you can use riddle to decipher if they're doing that to you. Okay. Um, or if you've got a bunch of clues and you want to kind of piece piece them together. Uh, scan. We've already covered. That's for, for focusing on on um, something specific. And it's not awareness. So scan is an awareness. Awareness is a bit more of a passive thing. 
um, and the lawn master will probably ask you to roll awareness, but um, I think you can also in, uh, request the roll of awareness. Then song is um, uh, also an interesting one, so that's poem, singing, and making music. I'm not sure what the mechanical use of song is. Um, maybe uh, you want to boost the morale of the team or something, uh, but mechanically I'm not 100% sure what, <laughs> what you'd use song for. Stealth is an interesting one. You can also shadow others, so you can kind of help conceal others. That's something you probably wouldn't think of in stealth, but you can do that. And travel, uh, I think it's the last one I'll touch on here. Where is travel? Over there. Uh, travel is to evaluate the length of a journey, um, to read a map, or estimate if a, if a stranger is safe to approach. So you, you, you'd use that in the journey rolls, I believe, you have to roll travel, but I think you can also just roll travel if you're traveling a short distance, like, um, so you can uh, evaluate the, uh, yeah, I, I guess, I think evaluate the length of a journey, that's part of the journey roll, um, but you can use travel to read a map or estimate if a stranger is safe to approach. So that's, I think, the two mechanics you can use it for during play um, outside of journey rolls is um, those two. Reading maps and estimating if someone's safe to approach is where you can use travel. Otherwise, it seems to be used for journey rolls. Now we're going to go over to combat. Okay. So... Um, combat, axes, bows, spears, and swords, each, um, each allows the player to use any weapon within that specific category. So in 1E, there was other rules where you had to have specific ones. Now, if it's an axe, it's an axe. If it's a great axe, small axe, you've got something in axes, you sorted, um, you covered. Uh, the priest, uh, priest, um, what is that? Specified pre-generated character sheets or, or item cards. So, uh, the character sheets will specify... Um, your combat proficiency and then you also have these item cards which have the stats of that individual item that you might be using for this dagger and these are really really nice I, I like the um, physicality of cards during role playing session okay so um, yeah you can just see the 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 damage and the injury and the load, how heavy it is, um, the damage it does, and that's the injury rating that someone has to roll against if they want to protect themselves against the wound. Okay. So then you have uh, endurance and hope, uh, these two over here. So I've explained hope earlier, and players who drop to zero endurance, they fall unconscious, they wake an hour later with one point of endurance. That's um, if you know, uh, if the law master decides that they're awake, you know, if, if there's other players around that could maybe rescue them, or if their attacker is maybe not that malicious that doesn't want to kill them, they would wake an hour later with one point of endurance uh, if they survive. Um, then a short rest is um, how you would try to recover endurance, and you generally would do that um, once per session, and that's uh, in game terms, it feels like it's roughly an hour long, and that's, you know, Suggest that you do that midday, um, and you recover endurance equal to your strength. So there, are, this character has got strength of three, so he would recover three endurance for a short rest. If he's wounded, he doesn't recover anything. Okay, so it's it's not good to have a wound because then for a short rest you don't regain that three endurance. Um, prolonged rest, uh, all endurance is recovered, unless a character is wounded. Then only the endurance equal to the strength uh, is recovered. And only one prolonged rest is allowed uh, per session, and that's uh, per night. And the law master might allow for more than one if in a safe area, normally uh, a night's rest. So, you know, if you're super, super safe area, maybe you can double down and get a, a deep sleep, a deep rest, where, where even if you're wounded, you will get two, uh, two se um, sets of uh, three back, so it's six. But, you know, if, if you're not wounded and you, you rest, you get your full endurance back, so you wouldn't need to double down, from what I can see. Then, 
Hope spent uh, grants 1D or 2D when inspired. We've covered that already. So when you spend uh, hope, your rolls, you just add another D6. Or if it's inspired, which means if you've used your distinctive feature to make yourself feel inspired, then you can get two when you spend hope. Okay. So keep that in mind when you do invoke a, uh, a distinctive feature. It's probably a good time to spend your hope cash in for two, two D6s. Um, so let's have a look here. So certain cultural virtues um, like this, there's certain cultural virtues where you can also spend hope. And uh, if you add zero in your rest um, from a prolonged rest, you get one hope back. Because normally you only get hope back at, uh, at the fellowship phase. So keep that in mind um, that if you have zero hope and you have a prolonged rest, you get one hope back. So they ask me about valor and wisdom, these two here. Here's your wisdom. So your wisdom is self-confidence and good judgment, and your target number is wits. And your valor, your target number is your heart rating. Um, well, it's worked out from your heart rating. It's your heart's target number, and um, that is your hero's courage. So a lawmaster might request a wisdom or valor roll. Um, then we've got rewards. So uh, rewards uh, is, so you'll see as a section for rewards, uh, that's when you get given a weapon or defensive gear um, by your own folk or generous lords. So uh, that's when you uh, level up your valor, you get given a reward. Um, if you ever spend, you know, experience to level up your valor, but they don't really cover how you spend points in the starter set. If you play them as they are, there. Once you read the core rule book, then you could expand on these characters. Um, so during the campaign, you're probably going to get rewards, um, and you start off with a virtue. Now in the, in the core game, if you spend a point or uh, you buy another point of wisdom, you get a virtue, and if you buy spend a um, purchase another point of valor, you get a reward. But in the campaign, you start off with a virtue and you probably uncover um, rewards. Just keep that in mind. And uh, what a virtue is, is they sort of like special abilities. They complement the hero's arsenal. So yeah, you can see it's plus one to parry. So it actually gives you a, a mechanical buff. Um, useful items. They are where is that on this sheet? I remember seeing it. Um, there you go, war gear. Uh, where would you list useful items? Yeah, traveling gear. I guess that's like useful items. So he's got a, a Turkish Wayfarer bundle. So he's the explorer. That's his traveling gear. Um, I don't see where you can actually list your useful items on the sheet. There is combat, rewards, virtues, conditions. Uh, I think the feature is your war gear, your armor, and traveling gear. So yeah, I. I don't see, it's probably, uh, they probably consider it under traveling gear. And they don't actually cover the journey rules in, in the starter set either. So if you just kind of want to work out the, the distance of something, you can roll um, travel to work out how far something is. But there's no sort of convoluted um, rules or, or expansive rules on, journey, on, on traveling uh, or journeying. Um, so you've got travel gear, but they don't really cover too much about what you use that for. Um, we'll see maybe in the adventure they touch on that. But uh, useful items is you can declare if you're carrying, carrying flint and steel, for example. Um, and when you use an appropriate role like craft, you can um, you can kind of and you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start a fire, I'm using craft, but I've got useful items with me, which is uh, flint and steel, and that'll grant you an additional D6. So if you, if you start the adventure off or you in acquire useful items, then you could use them in, 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 in a, um, to a complement your skill roll. Okay, so um, an, adventure, an adventure should generally last three sessions. They're three hours each. So you have your introduction, and then you have your scene, and then the end of the session. So um, the game comes with five uh, ready-to-play adventures, which is pretty great. Uh, yeah, uh, 
a staple for a starter set. Um, so it, it takes the pressure of off the lore master and, uh, and the players a bit for the improv uh, improvisation. So you, you, you've been giving, uh, given these um, stories and campaigns just to jump right in. Um, so generally, um, five, five, five uh, adventures, each adventure should last you about three sessions, three gaming sessions. So that's about uh, 15 ga gaming sessions. And if each gaming session is three hours long, you've got 44, 45 hours of game time in this one box. So this box should last you 45 hours. Okay, so you've got five, five adventures. Each one lasts three evenings, and the evening is three hours with the gameplay. So that's 45 hours. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's good, good value for money there. Um, so let's touch on those, those points. Introduction, uh, the Law Master... Uh, will describe when, so that's the date or time of the year, where, it's the location, what, which is introducing the situation, why, and information that allows the players to get involved. So the introduction is very much the lore master. Then the scenes, um, these are multiple scenes, each requiring players to make, make meaningful decisions. Um, and you, you get main and secondary scenes, like you get smaller scenes and, and bigger scenes. And uh, then so that's very similar to what we discussed previously, where the players are responding to a challenge or an obstacle. And then at the end of the session, uh, the session ends, but the adventure perhaps is not completed. So then the players would resume the next time you play, but it's always encouraged to have a recap at the beginning of the session to help players um, remember what's happening. Um, so that's that's super super important just to kind of have that recap. And if the adventure did conclude, then the next session you get together, um, a, you get to sort of plan the next adventure, and that would be kind of like your fellowship phase. Uh, but in the starter set, it's more of uh, you just sit down and chat about oh, which adventure you're going to start next, and maybe just jump straight into that adventure. So let's just move on to combat. So combat, you have opening volleys. And that's um, when there's a separate distance between you and the enemy. All involved is are granted uh, an open a volley, opening volley if they have ranged weapons to make it with. Uh, that's one volley uh, for a regular distance and two volleys or more if the distance is, is, is quite far apart. Uh, normally the heroes initiate the opening volleys unless the lawmaster or the circumstances um, deem it otherwise. And uh, volley attacks are resolved as normal. So if you shooting with a bow, that's a normal bow attack. Um, when concluded, that that's the end of open volleys, opening volleys. There's no more, and then it goes to close quarter combat. And close quarter combat is handled in rounds. Um, and we have these um, these coasters that come in handy for that um, for close quarter. So you'll see um, these. Th this side of the coaster is very much uh, geared for uh, journey rules, so that's not touched on in the starter set, but um, this is touched in the starter set, and that's the stances. So I'll cover that. Um, so stances, the player heroes choose their stance, and I'll cover that in a moment, and then... Um, the engagement session happens where all the combatants are paired with one or more opponents. Um, normally, I would uh, grant uh, the player's first choice um, unless they've been ambushed, I guess. Uh, that, that's kind of how I would see that. Um, so if the players haven't been ambushed, they would get uh, to pair themselves with the combatants. With their targets if they were ambushed then the other way around but that's just sort of my mindset on it that's not what the rule covers the rules just seems to be the players always choose uh, the their their uh, adversaries um, that's they get that sort of initiative um, attack role resolution um, I do believe they cover that initially a little bit later but not as in depth as I believe the core rulebook. I think they simplified it where the players always just get to choose unless stated otherwise. So we might touch on that a little bit later. Um, 
an attack roll resolution, so combat uh, action to resolve. So you have stance, this is the stance card. Um, and the stance card is uh, for the core rulebook are included, so this is actually for the core rulebook. Uh, they're meant to be used for the full game, but you can you 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 are using these stances in the the um, starter set. Um, so the starter set makes mention of forward, open, and defensive. So it makes more sense. And then you've got rearward. So you can only take rearward if there are two other players in one of these positions. Then you can take rearward. And rearward lets you use a re you have to use ranged com uh, ranged weapon, uh, but you can't be targeted um, to be attacked. Okay, but they don't touch on um, your stance actions because there are special actions you can do, but that's not covered in the starter set. And um, when you're looking at when the battle starts, what sequence and what order, who gets it, who who uh, attacks is um, the players generally always go first and um, it starts with forward then open then defensive then rearward that would be your order or sequence of events so engagement um, player heroes choose an enemy if all are taken then they get to assist with one that is already taken so touched on that earlier so if you know the battle starts, you say, I'm going to attack that orc, and someone else is going to attack that ruffian. And if everyone's been assigned and there's no one left for you, then you're like, well, I'm going to help um, you know, my friend attack that ruffian or that orc. If, you, if there are more enemies than players, then the law master allocates as they see fit or holds some enemies back uh, in rearward to use as ranged attacks on any of the heroes. So... That's basically, if, if you've allocated your, um, let's just say, these are enemies. Oh, we'll just use the black dice, why not? You guys should be able to see that, yeah. So there's black dice, and we've got our heroes. Forward, open, and rearward. Um, we're going to say, oh, he, this guy's going to attack this guy. This guy's going to attack this guy. The rearward's going to attack this guy. Now you've got these guys left over. The law master will choose what's going to happen. Are they going to... You know, hold back and attack in rearward, or are they are going to, you know, get up and close and, and attack them like that? You get the drift. So um, any any leftover enemies or adversaries that haven't been assigned yet, the lawmaster gets to do assign those. Attack resolution, unless stated otherwise, the player heroes re resolve the attacks first. So I believe that probably in the in the adventures there might be a case where it's told that you are being ambushed and then the enemy gets to attack first. Possibly, I'm not sure. But generally, the, the heroes get to attack first. And uh, like I said, com close combat first, then ranged. And when, once all the heroes have gone, then it's the turn of the adversaries to attack. The dice pool is allocated based on the weapon's combat proficiency. You can see over there. So you get 1d12 plus that stat. So that's what that roll would look like. Um, and the target number is calculated using your strength rating, uh, adding the enemies parry modifier. So um, armor is used for when you're protecting against the wound, but um, the enemy's parry modifier is what you use to calculate your target number. So it's all under strength, so the target number is 15. And then you still got to add in the parry modifier. The parry modifier, if you look at an enemy, let's just see if you can find one. Uh, You'll, you'll see on the, on the enemy, it'll probably say plus one or plus two or whatever. You add that to your target number. Okay. That's different to uh, a player's parry rating. The enemy must just meet that parry rating. That is your parry rating. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's a slight difference. Uh, your parry rating is uh, total. That is the total that the enemy needs to hit is 17. It's always 17 for um, Paladin Took, the second. Um, but when you're trying to hit enemies, it's it's 15 plus their modifier. So they on their you know the adversary sheet will have a plus one, plus two, plus three kind of thing. So that's just a slight difference between how player heroes they have a full total, where adversaries have a modifier which you add to your target number. Uh, damage is based on the weapon, but can increase based on the degrees of success. So that's where those um, 
sixes come in. <laughs> I'm not going to put three sixes there. <laughs> um, those where the those those the degrees of degrees of success come in, you get to spend those to increase your damage. Uh, I'll cover now what those are in combat. But that's actually the first time you get to really use them outside of just role playing and making your actions a bit more uh, elaborate or effective. In combat, you can really, there's a clear mechanic in the starter set that lets you know what to do with those. Uh, if you roll a six, you grant a special icon. These can be spent um, these can be spent uh, on uh, so yeah you, you can basically collect these if you if you get more than one uh, it forms a bit of a, a pool on that roll on that roll um, so if you if you spend one of these icons if you spend one of them you can perform what they call a heavy blow and it costs one of these and you add your strength uh, which is three your strength rating to the damage dealt so if i was using this dagger the damage is two so then i would add in my strength rating three and all that costs is this little symbol and i get to add that three to my two damage so i do five instead of two so it's when you roll a six during combat you can cash that in Okay, um, then you, there's another ability you can use for these, um, so like falls in a special damage, uh, fend off, it costs one icon, one of these again, and um, for one icon, for bow, uh, uh, it'll cost one icon, you get to add plus two to your parry for the next attack on you, so you get to kind of hang on to that. Uh, for the next attack, you get to hang on to that, and when somebody attacks you, you get to add plus two to that. So his parry will be 19, but only for the next attack, once off. It's called fend off. Um, and then you get pierce. It costs one icon if you've got bows and spears, and it costs two icons if you're using a sword. And for that, you get to add plus two to your feet die. So if I rolled, uh, say, eight and um on my other dice i got let's just show where is it where is it what there we go that was weird so let's just say i rolled eight and two sixes so i want to cash those in because you'll see now what i'm going to do with them i get to add two to my feet die so i i met the target number that's the most important thing you meet the target number but this is over and above, so you want to kind of increase your damage or what you do with it. So I've met the target number. Now I, because now I've rolled, I've rolled 20, and, and the target number, say, was 17. 15 plus the two parry modifier from the adversary. And uh, now I want to cash these in. So with pierce, to, to perform a pierce, um, you spend two if you're using a, a, like a sword, um, which would classify, like we'd say, for, for a dagger as well. Um, and you could possibly trigger a pierce blow. So um, if you ever roll, um, I'll tell you now what a pierce blow is. Okay, so a pierce blow is triggered when you uh, roll a 10 or a Gandalf symbol on the feet die. So a 10 or a Gandalf, you automatically pierce your, your enemy. Uh, well, you, you've... you've um, You've performed a pierce blow. They get to do a protection roll against that. But you've performed a piercing blow. Um, it could do a, a, a leave a wound on the enemy. And if an enemy gets one wound, they're out of battle normally. So you can try to decrease their endurance to zero by just whittling it away, by just chipping at their, at their endurance. Uh, so you could go the route where you spend that one of those sixes to, remember, add your strength to it. So it takes it up to five damage. You could go that route, or you go, oh wow, this is a big troll, it's going to take very long. I'm going to just try to land a wound on him, and that's why we're going to take the, um, we rolled in an eight and two sixes, so like I'll just, you know, make that very clear. We gain, that, that is a successful roll, so we get to do that, let me see if I can hold this without dropping it. We get to do that two damage, that doesn't go away, you don't lose that. But we're not using this to buff that anymore, we're going to use this to buff the 
the D12. And what we're doing there is if you ever roll a 10 or a Gandalf on the D12, it lands, uh, it has the, the uh, potential of landing a wound. So we're going to add 2 to this, which takes it up to 10. So now we have the potential of landing a wound, and now the adversary must do a protection roll um, to see if they um, avoid that. So what the adversary now has to do is to roll a protection roll. So their target number is 14 for this weapon. Okay, that is it. It's target number 14. They get to roll a feet die plus um, their their armor. So I'll give you an example here. This leather shirt has plus uh, 1D. Uh, let's have a look here. This corset has plus 2D. So when you're doing a protection roll, that's where these the, the, the armor comes in. It's to protect you from a wound. So let's just say the enemy was wearing a leather shirt. It's 1D. So his target number is 14. And he rolls a D12 and 1D6. And he wants to try to meet that 14. He rolled 8. He fails. He gets a wound. He's out of the battle if it's a regular adversary. Okay. So that's how that works. So when you attack somebody, there's sort of two levels. There's the initial um, damage that you get to do. And remember, you can do a heavy blow, which means you can up that damage if you land at a 6. But that's still in that first phase of the damage you're doing. And then you've got to work out, have you rolled on your D12? Did you roll a 10 or a Gandalf? And that will trigger the potential of doing a wound. And the third part of that is they do a protection roll against your weapon's target number. And then that's calculated based on they get 1D12 and uh, D6 is based on which armor they're wearing. And that's what they roll against your target number on your weapon and if they get two I mean if they get one wound they aren't. Heroes get to do get to, they get to uh, receive two wounds. So your first wound uh, affects you as we described earlier. Your second wound knocks you out. Okay. One wound for a hero requires them to tick the wound box. This affects their endurance recovery rate healing and a second wound reduces the hero's endurance to zero and they are knocked out unconscious. No wounds no additional wound box is ticked. Heroes heal their wound during the fellowship phase or allow a week of in-game time to have the wound removed. So you've got to kind of, uh, after about a week of, of play time, and you have to sort of figure out how long a week is, then the wound box gets taken away. So that's how it's removed. Um, a healing roll can be made to reduce the week-long period. Uh, if you roll, if you that's on your healing over here, and um, a successful roll reduces the time to recover by one day. For any uh, d sixes that you roll, for any d sixes you roll, um, it reduces it by another day. Uh, to a minimum of a day. So the, the, the most you can re reduce it down to is a day. You still have to spend a day to heal. Um, but you can, I believe, only do one um, heal roll, I believe, a day. Um, a healing roll can be made to reduce the week-long roll or period. Uh, yeah, only one healing roll is allowed per day. All right. So... Just to make that clear, if you get a wound, it takes you a week of in-game time to heal. Uh, in the between adventures, that's called the fellowship phase. They don't really cover that in this uh, starter set, but that's say so between adventures, you get to remove that wound. Um, so yeah, I think they've omitted that from the starter set, but that's something that they should have added in, I believe. And um, yeah, if you want to speed up that healing, if it's you're still doing the adventure, you, it's going to take 10 days, it's too long. Every day you can do a, a healing roll, that one, and that reduces it down by one day. So every day you can do a healing roll, and that will bring it down by one day. But the, the, the lowest you can bring it down to is one day. It takes one day to heal. And for every six you roll, every time you do a healing roll, it actually brings it down by two days instead of one. Okay. Uh, serious injuries and death is discouraged in the game. Um, it's not really what the starting adventures are set out to sort of achieve. So just keep that in mind. It's 
it's more of an adventure of exploration it seems um, uh, but you know that's role playing you get to choose how you play it that's the wonderful thing of role playing if you want to you know turn the starting adventures into something like a grim dark go for it that's you know you can turn it into a horror story and and live on the edge with massive consequences <laughs> you know the world's your oyster that's what, what role playing is all about um and yeah we've already touched on that starting action uh the stance actions are not covered in the starter set and um there is something called improvised actions so um you can kind of as you'll see here, there, there are actions you can do during during combat with that ability you've chosen, with that stance, I mean. But like I said, it's not covered in the starter set. It's not encouraged, it seems. Um, but you can improvise an action. Um, uh, they permit it in combat instead of your attack, so you forfeit your attack, which functions very much like the core rulebook ones. Uh, a round is, to con be, is considered to be about 30 seconds. So if what you're going to do fits within that 30 seconds of time frame, go for it. If it's going to require more time, maybe it's going to take cost you two rounds um, to achieve that. And um, you need to decide if that if that action requires a roll or not. It could be just, hey, I'm, too, I'm, I'm using my, my, my attack action. I'm forfeiting that to do this, and that might be su sufficient. Or the law master might decide, no, no, you need to do an additional roll in one of your skills, maybe, to achieve something. Uh, and if you do ro have to do a roll, um, then you need to always attribute a positive uh, effect to that or a negative effect if you fail. Okay. And um, combat could also be avoided through speech. So you could use sort of persuade to sort of uh, avoid combat, so keep that in mind when playing the starter set. But just keep in mind that the adversaries can also use persuade on you to lure you and trick you into a trap. Um, and that concludes the, the starter set. So um, there is another book, uh, two books. Um, so you've got the, a book here on the Shire. So that's, that's um, just gives you background information about the Shire, a, a good one to read um, along. It complements the actual adventures as well. So this is just great sort of uh, Tolkien-inspired content that you just get to enjoy, and why wouldn't you? Um, okay, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed that uh, dive into the starter set. And um, yeah, I look forward to playing this, um, potentially with my kids. Um, it would be great to just sort of introduce them to the One Ring using this, this system, or uh, with my gaming group. Um, my main reason for doing uh, going, uh, learning the starter set is to help me understand the basic shift from 1E to 2E. And I'm really, I really, I'm really glad I did. It's helped me tremendously. And now the big uh, jump now is to read the core rulebook. So um, wishing you all a good morning if it's morning and a good evening if it's evening. All right, take care. God bless. Bye.